One of the hearings I chaired, we had testimony from a guy uh, named, named Dr. Epstein. Oh, yeah, I know about it. Yeah. Um, and he's a psychologist, used to be the editor of Psychology Today. He's an academic. He, he's, by the way, not a conservative. He, mm -hmm. He's a liberal Democrat yeah. who voted for Hillary Clinton and openly supported Hillary Clinton. And, and he did empirical research on Google's manipulative search outcomes. So it's interesting psychology. When you type in a search, the autocorrect, the auto fill in, mm -hmm. not the autocorrect, but what automatically populates, yeah. makes a huge difference. Um, and the first few stories that come up make a huge difference. And there was a dramatic differential between when you typed in Hillary Clinton, it would auto populate good things. Yeah, all good things, yeah. When you typed in Donald Trump, it would auto populate bad things. And the stories that would come up would be predominantly good stories for Hillary, predominantly bad stories uh, for Trump. And what was interesting is, is, is Dr. Epstein did the study and he concluded that in 2016, Google's uh, deceptive search outcomes shifted 2.4 million votes. Hmm. To Hillary Clinton, and he said this as a Hillary Clinton supporter, but he was he was horrified. But he also projected. He said in 2015, he said big tech is getting worse. It's getting more aggressive. They could move as many as 15 million votes hmm. to the Democrats in 2020, and and so I think it's a huge threat. I'm Dave Rubin and this is The Rubin Report. Quick reminder everybody to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click that notification bell so that you maybe, just maybe, actually see our videos in your feed. And joining me today is a Republican senator from Texas, the co-host of The Verdict Podcast and a man who uses almost as many Star Wars references on Twitter as I do, Senator Ted Cruz. Welcome to The Rubin Report. Dave, it's great to be with you, and I will say I'm, I'm learning already as you start with telling people to subscribe on YouTube, <laughs> so I'm a much newer YouTuber and podcaster, and so, and so that, 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 that is, is, is good tutelage. Yes, well, I'm going to need you in the Senate to fight the battles that I have been fighting on, uh, on YouTube for quite Amen. some time. Uh, all right, so we're obviously going to get into big tech. I also should mention we're dressed virtually exactly the same, which is a little weird, but you've rocked the uh, Well, and look, I, I told you, we need to, these are Lucchese ostrich, which uh, are uh, tough to beat, and I've had these resold several times, but they're, they're good... Uh, all right, here's something interesting. We are talking yes. a minute ago about how you grew up in, in New York. Do you know where I started wearing cowboy boots? Well, I'm going to guess New York for some reason. New or maybe uh, New Jersey. Jersey. Why Jersey? Right. Jersey cowboy boots, what? It's, it's a weird story. So, yeah. so I grew up in Houston. Yeah. I'm, I, I, and in Houston, but I was, you know, as a sort of junior high and high school kid, I was kind of a preppy kid for a while, had long hair, had a spike for a while. I mean, went through these different phases. But, you know, I was a city boy, and so I didn't wear boots in school growing up. And then I went to college at Princeton in New Jersey, and I was 17, and I was away from home, and I just got homesick. And so I said, all right, I'm going to go buy a pair of boots, and it was sort of a way for a 17-year-old to kind of hold on to your home. And so I started wearing boots as a freshman in college, and I've worn them ever since, but it took going to New Jersey, which is a little ridiculous, to start wearing boots. So you were basically the Texas boots guy at Princeton University. So I remember I had a, a car that, that, that my grandfather had given me. It was a 78 Ford Fairmont. We called it the Green Bomb. Uh -huh. And I remember digging that car out of the snow using the heel of my boots, which by the way, doesn't work very well. It's a really like bad idea, but as a Texas teenager, I didn't know any better. We got it out, but it was... Uh, but here we are. All right, <laughs> moving on from boots for a moment, the one other important thing that we have to get to before all the issues, the beard situation. Because I think, like me, you've now become more beard than man at this point. Something, <laughs> something happened. When, how long you have had the beard? About like a year uh, and a half maybe? Yeah, a year and a half. Something so like that? Thanksgiving two years ago. Okay, so about two years. Yeah. Something happened to me when I got the beard, which is about three years ago or so. I sensed a change in me. Do you sense that change? You seem to have gotten a little, a little more feisty on Twitter yeah, since the beard. Is there a connection? There's a little bit of just kind of screw it. I mean, <laughs> I mean that, uh, all right, so what prompted, why'd you grow the beard? 
I go off the grid every August. I yep. shut down, no yep. phone, no TV, nothing, no, no news. And it's the, I've done it for three years. I'm about to do it in a couple yep. weeks. And the first time I did it, I just decided not to shave. I came back, everybody right. said they loved the beard. And then, you know, it took over like Black Spider-Man. I know you're also a, yeah. uh, a video, uh, a comic book guy. Yeah. yeah. So actually my beard story is very much the same. It was Thanksgiving. I mean, holidays I never shave. And so I would always sort of grow a little bit of stubble during holidays. And it just kind of over Thanksgiving, I said, all right, pack with it. I'm not going to shave. And it was, it was not, uh, you know, there was no profound <laughs> statement. It was just kind of like, eh. This, this will be interesting. And then Twitter likes it, and you pretty much uh, have to, you know, bow to the mob. The, the, the guy who runs my political operation, he emailed me when I came back, and his email was like, worst idea <laughs> ever. <laughs> so I had to be like, all right, to heck with you. I, I, then I'm definitely keeping it. Yeah, you're also a Simpsons guy. I mean, we could do every reference, basically every 80s and 90s reference. We could just set aside politics and do that the whole time. I don't think I've seen Twitter get more angry than when I said a couple of years ago that I thought every character but Lisa Simpson was right of center. That Homer, Marge, Barton, Maggie are all conservatives and libertarians and Lisa is the, the, the self-righteous leftist. Ooh. And what was interesting, I look, I was mostly just kind of riffing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the Twitter world went nuts. Like the, the, they could not handle and they're like, don't you understand Lisa's the hero? And I'm like, yeah, except she's self-righteous and criticizing <laughs> everyone and a pain in the ass. <laughs> Look, Homer is every man. Yeah. I mean, he's... He's basically a libertarian, right? It, yeah. I, Bart clearly is a libertarian yeah, rebel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, that... Maggie, do you remember the episode? Maggie is in the Ayn Rand School for Talks. Oh yeah, and then oh, yeah. they do the Great Escape music, and yeah. she she escapes from it. Yeah. So I'm I'm calling Maggie. And by the way, Maggie's also a gun owner because she saw, shot Mr. Burns. <laughs> so so you know. And <laughs> then all right, Marge is yeah. So Marge, that's the tough one here. But look, Marge is oh she's traditional. Of, she's traditional. She's the anchor of the family. She keeps she keeps everyone together. She gets. Homer to be a good dad. Marge is the one that there's the, the fewest indicia, but it... <laughs> but, the left hates when anything in pop culture, they want to own it all. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's good to have fun. Now that we've gotten the important stuff out of the way, let's talk about big tech, because you've been right in the center of this thing. As you know, I've been fighting it from, yeah. my, from my garage for the last five years. Uh, Trump did this executive action. Uh, Two thirty is the yep. is the what do you call it? It's not it's not a bill. It's a so uh, it's section section two thirty of a bill called Communications Decency Act. Right. So basically, what he did was strip some protections from the big boys, from Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. Now, my personal preference, and I, I think we're pretty close on this. The libertarian side is you don't want the government running around sending regulators to these yep. companies because yep. that's not going to do good. But stripping protection, protections to me seemed like the right idea. Do, do you agree it was the right idea? Is it enough? Is it not enough? Etc. So I think it is the right idea. Um, it, it's something I'd been urging Trump to do for three years. So I'm, I'm glad that, that the administration did it. Um, Listen, I agree with your sensibility. Nobody wants government free speech police. I mean, that, that would be a terrible outcome. Well, some people do, but... Uh, <laughs> nobody who's not insane, and that's yeah. a qualifier. We can talk about some more because there are a lot of people that fall into that category. But yeah. government free speech police would be a terrible outcome. But what big tech is doing, it's deliberate, it's conscious, it's naked. It's abusive and it's dangerous. I think it's the single biggest threat to free speech and democracy we have in this country. Uh, because big tech has become a monopoly controlling the instruments of communication. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've chaired multiple hearings in the Senate on big tech censorship. And one of the hearings we talked about a document that Google had prepared. It's called the Good Censor. Mm -hmm. So they prepared its PowerPoint, about 50 page long, and it talks about how the old vision of the internet was the free speech laissez-faire internet, where people could speak and say what they wanted. And then it talked about the new vision of the internet, and this is Google's own words, is the European style censorship model. And by the way, the four companies that Google identified as implementing it were Google, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Mm -hmm. 
this is a conscious decision and, and the dangers are enormous. So the question is how do you fix it? If it is a problem, we have a long discussion about whether it's a problem, although they're not hiding it anymore. Yeah, I think most sane people at this point would agree that they're, even, even people that disagree with us politically on this, I think most people realize that the extraordinary amount of power is a problem one way or another. So I will, it's interesting the political debate though, one of the talking points of big tech and the left is they don't engage in censorship. And the reason they say that is they say, well, there are no objective data that prove we do. And, and it's, you know, there's the old aphorism of the, of the guy who kills his parents and then pleads mercy on the court because he's an orphan. Mm -hmm. It's true. There are no objective data because big tech controls all the data. And they, 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 there's zero transparency, zero accountability. So you can use anecdotes. And I, I've gone through lots and lots of specific anecdotes. But every time you ask big tech, and I've done it in writing, I've done it in hearings, simple questions. Um, all right, in the 2018 election cycle, how many posts from Republican candidates for office did you block or shadow ban? How many posts from Democratic candidates for office did you block or shadow ban? There are objective answers to that. I mean, there is a number. Yeah. And they know the number, and they refuse to answer it and then say there are no data. And, and so how do you fix it? I think one way to fix it is getting rid of the special immunity from liability that big tech has that Congress gave them. So that's 230, right? That's 230. Okay. And the reason 230 was passed, Congress believed big tech would be a, a neutral public forum. In other words, it wasn't fair to sue Facebook for a comment made by a, an individual commenter because it wasn't, they weren't the speaker, it was mm -hmm. someone else. And so that was, that was Congress's reasoning. So we're going to give big tech this immunity from liability because it's third party speakers and we want to see the internet grow. Mm -hmm. Well, what's happened is big tech changed their mind. They said, we're not going to be, to use the, the language of the Google document, the, the laissez faire free speech place anymore. We're going to censor. Well, you know what? If they're going to silence views they disagree and promote views they agree with, they don't deserve, I don't believe, as a public policy matter, a special protection vote for liability. There's also the antitrust laws. Google is a monopoly. Uh, by any measure, big tech is richer, stronger, more powerful than AT&T was when mm -hmm. it was broken up under the antitrust laws. They're bigger than, than U.S. Steel was. Uh, a line from The Godfather, we're bigger than U.S. Steel. Well, they're bigger than U.S. <laughs> Steel. Um, and that abuse of power. So I've also, you want to talk about the real, what the Trump administration did on Section 230 will be challenged. It's at the FCC. There'll be litigation. The real bite here is federal antitrust litigation, which, which I have urged the president to pursue, I've urged the vice president to pursue, I've urged the attorney general to pursue, I've urged the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission to pursue, I've urged the White House chief of staff to pursue, I've urged the White House counsel to pursue, to, to, to force the transparency, to get the answers, and to stop their, their, their naked bias. Are you worried though that as we sit here right now in the middle of July, only you know three, four months before an election, that in, cert in a certain way that the ship has already sailed, the yes. damage that they've done, and even if you could get everything you wanted tomorrow, past tomorrow, by the time the processes and the systems are, in, are implemented, congratulations, the election's passed. Uh, uh, I am deeply worried about it. One, uh, one of the hearings I chaired, we had testimony from a guy uh, named, named Dr. Epstein. Oh, yeah, I know about it. Yeah. Um, and he's a psychologist, used to be the editor of Psychology Today. He's an academic. He, he's, by the way, not a conservative. He, mm -hmm. He's a liberal Democrat. Yeah who voted for Hillary Clinton and openly supported Hillary Clinton. And, and he did empirical research on Google's manipulative search outcomes. So it's interesting psychology. When you type in a search, the autocorrect, the auto fill in, mm -hmm. not the autocorrect, but what automatically populates, yeah. makes a huge difference. Um, and the first few stories that come up make a huge difference. And there was a dramatic differential 
between when you typed in Hillary Clinton, it would auto-populate good things. Yeah, all good things, yeah. When you typed in Donald Trump, it would auto-populate bad things. And the stories that would come up would be predominantly good stories for Hillary, predominantly bad stories uh, for Trump. And what was interesting is, is, is Dr. Epstein did the study and he concluded that in 2016, Google's uh, deceptive search outcomes shifted 2.4 million votes. Hmm. To Hillary Clinton, and he said this as a Hillary Clinton supporter, but he was he was horrified. But he also projected. He said in 2015, he said big tech is getting worse. It's getting more aggressive. They could move as many as 15 million votes hmm. to the Democrats in 2020, and and so I think it's a huge threat. So as a sci-fi guy, because yeah. I know you're a sci-fi guy. In a certain way, doesn't it feel like we're already in the dystopian future that we're always worried about, that so many great movies are about, that in a way we're, we're kind yes. of there already? We are because the power and ubiquity, I mean, what makes social media difference, look, there's all sorts of biased media outlets. The New York Times is ridiculously <laughs> biased, but you, but you can pick it up and you can say, okay, this is a partisan rag and you can know it. What is so, such a game changer with social media is that it's invisible. So if they don't like what you say, you can post and it just fades into ether and mm -hmm. you don't know. You have no idea. So I've got, you know, on Twitter, I think my personal Twitter, I think we've got 3.7 million followers. I have no idea to this day. And I've asked, by the way, the CEOs, when I post something, what percentage of the people who have chosen to follow me see it? They won't answer that. Mm -hmm. Did you know that, that shadow banning is actually in the Twitter terms of service? I have there, not there, seen There's that. a, I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you after this, or my guys can maybe yeah. pull it up yeah. and, and we'll show it right now. In their terms of service, when they renewed it on January 1st because they know nobody's paying attention, it actually says that they can throttle accounts and not throttle accounts. So they're telling us in their own terms of service that it's in there. And then the guys get up on Capitol Hill and they tell you we don't do anything. It, it, it is the magnitude of the power and you know you talk about dystopian worlds the hard left and, I, and i'm interested dave so, so yeah. you used to be a man of the left and <laughs> nobody's perfect you know? you're not now yeah why i'd be interested in in <sighs> my audience has heard it many times but i'll give you the bumper sticker yeah. version was one day it just hit me that it could not possibly be true that everyone I disagree with is a bigot and a racist and a homophobe. And I know that sounds almost cliche to say, but every argument of the left came down to that. And I could not believe somehow that I was so morally right about every position right. that I had come to and that everyone else was so ridiculously evil. Like it was basically a math equation. And I was like, the math doesn't work here anymore. It can't be right. And then the bizarre thing that happened and I'm sure four years ago, I was saying all sorts of crazy things about you, and I was saying all sorts of crazy things about Rand Paul, and a and, bunch of and people- only half of that and, are true. And, <laughs> exactly, but, but, but a bunch of, but, a, but once you suddenly look at the other side and you go, holy cow, you know, these conservatives, these libertarians, they really just wanna get out of your way in, in most respects. Once you see that, uh, it's very welcoming. So it's like, I know we have political disagreements. Uh, we disagree on abortion, for example, and I'm more than happy to talk about it if you yeah. want to, but I know that you want to live in the same country as me. And the left has created this odd thing where if you don't agree with them on everything, you're out, man. And I, I just don't want to have anything to do with that. Look, I, I, I get that, and particularly in, in this time, and listen, the age of Trump, everything has gotten personal and angry and it's a morality play you know you have we're so pulled apart but look one of the differences that I get really frustrated with the left they are willing to use government power to impose their worldview on everybody mm -hmm. and to punish anyone who dares dissent this is true in the censorship world this is true it, 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 it is, at the end of the day, the left are status. They believe in government power. You know, I'm someone who, who cares deeply about the Constitution and Bill of Rights and free speech, and that means the right of people who disagree profoundly with me 
to speak and engage. And, and, and I agree with John Stuart Mill. The cure for bad speech is more speech. So don't silence views you disagree with. Engage with them on the merits and actually have ideally a, a civil, decent, respectful conversation. And you're right, you know, immediately starting with, you know, if every conversation begins with your Klansman, that, that sort of dampens the next step of the conversation. Yeah, but you, you don't get much further than that. Yeah. It, I got to show you, I have a copy of On, uh, on Liberty in my nightstand, so um, I, I'm with you on that. All right, I'm going to tell you something very funny. So you and I, before the show, were talking about the Houston Rockets, and I'm a diehard Houston Rockets mm -hmm. fan. One of the stranger things I own, when I was, I think I was in college, and I was on an airplane, and Hakeem Olajuwon was I already, on the I already love this story, wherever you're uh, going. He was, he was sitting up in first class, I was back in the cattle car, he was up, 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 and it was a time when I guess NBA players didn't fly private right. everywhere, but it was, he was sitting there. Right. And I was sort of starstruck, and so I went up and asked for his autograph, but the only thing I had is I was reading John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. That's incredible. And I had a red pen <laughs> that I was underlining it with. So I've got it home. I'm not sure where it is, which is, but I have a Hakeem Olajuwon, number 34, signed on the, on the, the title page of, of John Stuart Mill's You, you literally have my whole life in a book, basically. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's absolutely, absolutely incredible. That, I told you that 95 Rockets team is my, my favorite team of all time. All right, so wait a second. So let's, let's push a little further on yeah. this. So because the left wants to use state power in a way that, generally speaking, the right doesn't want to, or at least that you don't want to, if we're to go on this dystopian future idea, are you worried that if these guys really take power, I mean, they're gonna start jailing political opponents. They are going to use, we know they've already used the IRS to do all sorts of crazy things. I mean, these are things that are sort of conspiracy theories and then suddenly, at this point, nothing feels like a conspiracy theory. But it, it's all justified in the, in, there's a self-righteousness to it. We're right, anyone who disagrees is evil. Therefore, anything is justified to suppress the evil. You, you see that with cancel culture, where, mm -hmm. where people go, l like, get driven out, out of the public discourse. Look, when, when I was in college, I was a college debater, yes, I was one of the cool kids. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, so I was in college, I was the, the chairman of the conservative group in, in the debate debate society and, and one of my closest friends was the head of the liberal group and we would have arguments about free enterprise and socialism like what works what actually benefits humanity and actually that question is an important question too often people start with the assumption the other side wants humanity to suffer mm -hmm. if we start with the premise okay most people of goodwill would like people to be happier and more well off and more prosperous. We start with that premise. Mm -hmm. Then we can have a conversation about, okay, what systems produce more prosperity, more opportunity? It's, it's you know, a couple of years ago, I did three CNN town hall debates with Bernie Sanders. Yep. And, and they were 90 minutes long. And Bernie, look, to Bernie's credit, he's an unabashed socialist. I disagree with him, but he's honest. Mm -hmm. And we can have a conversation about, you know, socialism. I think if you look across the world, it doesn't work. It's produced misery, poverty, suffering, death. Um, you know, my family yeah. fled Cuba. Yeah. And so yeah. I'm more than happy to take the American free enterprise system, or as the left derisively calls it, capitalism, yeah. and put it up next to communism or socialism or any dictatorship they've implemented in every, any country on earth and people are better off, they have more opportunity, and, he, and in particular, there's the mobility. You know, you look at the dystopian, um, dystopian worlds, one of the elements of it is everyone is frozen in their place. Mm -hmm. Socialist countries, communist countries, there are rich people. They're powerful people. What you don't see is new rich people. What you don't see, you know, when my dad in 1957 was a teenage kid from Cuba, couldn't speak English, washing dishes, making 50 cents an hour. Why did he come to America? Because this is a country where you could be a teenage kid washing dishes and climb the, 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 that socioeconomic ladder. And Kind of worked out for his kid. It, it, 
If someone had told my father yeah. in 1957 that 50 years in the future his son would be in the Senate, that teenage immigrant could never have believed it. And, and, and that, but if we can have conversations, then we can say, all right, what works? What doesn't work? The left is afraid to have those conversations. Their ideas don't work. I, all right, there, there, there's a joke I, I, I tell sometimes, which is, how many radical leftists does it take to screw in a light bulb? How many? That's not funny! <laughs> like, it's like, come on, guys, just relax. Like, 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 lighten up. And, and you know, my, I was talking about in college when, when we were debating, we'd go, you know, I, he'd call me a fascist, I'd call him a, 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 a communist, and then we'd go get a beer. Yeah. Like, just, you know, not all of life has to be, I must destroy my enemy, and there's do, a lot of that right now. But do you think there's a fundamental reason for that? I, I think there actually is, that, that lefties now, and not always, and I actually want to ask you about what it used to be like when there yeah. was a sort of sane Democratic Party, but that there's a fundamental reason for the, the anger and the outrage and the perpetual craziness, which is they believe government is everything. And that you know this as a senator, it's a pretty freaking messy, probably often miserable game that you have to play to be, to be a politician in America or probably anywhere. And that because their whole worldview is through politics, as opposed to a religious or some other spiritual worldview, well, of course you're gonna be endlessly miserable. Do, do you think I'm ballparking something there? So I do, and, and it's, you know, it was interesting. I was talking the other night to a, a gentleman. He and his wife came from Cuba and came from C Cuba, fled under, under Castro. And he was talking about, he said, you know, Ted, you talk about the Constitution quite a bit. And he said, I think there are a lot of people like me who, who came from countries where the Constitution was meaningless. And they don't necessarily understand why that matters. And they're, they're a little bit skeptical of what why should the Constitution make a difference? And, and I was agreeing with him in that we need to explain that more. Government power, the history of humanity is largely a, a history of government oppressing the people. Now you need some government, I'm not an anarchist, yeah. you, you need government to, to protect your, your fundamental rights, to, to life, to liberty, to property. John Locke wrote, wrote about the, the, the fundamental natural rights. You need government to impose rule of law. And we see countries that don't have that are disasters. But the more power government has, the less liberty you have. Mm -hmm. and, and Jefferson had a great way of putting it. He described the Constitution as chains to bind the mischief of government. Um, yeah, you that, look at that's the First pretty Amendment. profound, yeah. You know, free speech is not about silencing those who disagree with you. Um, religious liberty, it's not about forcing everyone to practice your faith. It's about saying, look, it's up to you what faith you practice or none at all. That's, that's that right of conscience that you get to decide that it's not government that comes in. You know, you just had... All right, you know, you talked about abortion. You, you and I may disagree on abortion, but you just had Joe Biden a week ago say if he's elected, he's coming after the little sisters of the poor. No, I'm completely against that, by the way. I mean, I've done videos on it, yeah. I mean, that is an extreme view. You literally have politicians saying, those damn Catholic nuns, I'm gonna go after them and force them to a pay for abortion-inducing drugs. And th these are nuns who've taken vows of poverty and are helping mm -hmm. the poor and the sick and the needy. And, and government now for years has been persecuting them because they must conform. And, and it's just, look, I think being libertarian and live and let live, giving people like re respecting diversity solves a lot of the problems we have in the country. So, so speaking of diversity then, yeah. do you ever feel it because you mentioned your father and your family's story, because you're a Republican, because you're on the right, that in many ways the people who love to scream about diversity all day long, they've sort of stolen that from you. I, I know you don't wave it as a, as a victim card, but your own personal family story and, and because you're, you're, you look white, 
so to speak, okay. and because you're on the right, you're you're just a white guy. I, Congratulations. I, <laughs> look, I, on, on social media, it is amazing you look at some of the, some of the angry protesters who who sometimes are angry angry rich white guys who are telling everyone look the riots that that, that occurred following the horrific killing of George Floyd many of the neighborhoods that were burned down were african american neighborhoods some of the most poignant and powerful videos were of residents there crying, going, okay, you just burned my only grocery store. You, you know, my ki you know, African-American small business owners whose, whose stores were destroyed and destroyed by self-entitled, often middle or upper class kids. Look, I grew up, my, my mom is Irish and Italian from a working class family. She was the first person to ever go to college. Uh, my dad, you know, as I said, was an immigrant with nothing. When I was in high school, my parents went bankrupt. We, we had a, a small business. It was the mid 80s, oil crashed. We lost everything. We lost our home. We lost, every, I mean, lost everything. So I went to college at age 17. My parents couldn't pay any tuition. I was on my own at 17. And I'm grateful for a country that let a kid. Now, my parents gave me a home with love and nurturing. And so in that respect, I was rich. I was rich in terms of having a mom and dad who loved me and encouraged me. But, you know, I was on my own. And that's, that's the beauty of and this beauty, country. Yeah. And, and, and I think the single biggest lie in all of politics is that Republicans are the party of the rich and Democrats are the party of the poor. I think it's absolutely false. If you look at Democrats today, they are the party of Silicon Valley billionaires. They are the party of Wall Street tycoons. They are the party of power and resources. And, and Republicans, the party that I w want to be a part of is a blue collar party. We're the party of Ohio steel workers. We're the party of single moms waiting tables. We're the party of, of teenage kids like my dad washing dishes. Why? Because opportunity is why the ability of people to, to, to have a job and to work is powerful. Do you, do you see that as the ultimate irony of what's happened with Silicon Valley is that I think privately, I mean, I know a lot of these guys, yeah. privately they're libertarians. Of course they are because they want to create, they love competition and they want to be taxed low so that their businesses can thrive. And then publicly what you see them say is completely the reverse. Well, look, I mean, Silicon Valley is so bad that, you know, Peter, Peter. Um, <laughs> yeah. Peter has been a buddy of mine for, for 25 years. Yeah, we're I, friends too. Peter and I were friends yeah. before he, he, he had made his money. Uh, when Peter and I became friends, it was the mid-90s and he was a, a corporate lawyer practicing law. Huh. Um, Silicon Valley is so bad that Peter was driven out of it. I mean, he's moved to, to LA. To Los Angeles. Like, like it, 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 <laughs> uh, it, You know it, something's wrong when you're coming to LA for a safe haven from the left. It, it's, and, and there's, big tech is about power. And, and it's also about virtue signaling. It's about showing that you're morally self-righteous. Um, and when they're driving someone like Peter Thiel out saying, you are a heretic, and, and it's, it's on view after view after view, there is, you know, it's interesting, it, 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 it's a religious fervor. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's become the new religion. Wokeness is, and, and by the way, no one can be too pure. Like, like it, I, I mean, there's an element of like Robespierre setting up the, 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 the guillotine where, where they will come after if someone is only 99% woke, well, the 1% is coming after them. Yep. And, and that, well, that, we see that with all, with all these Hollywood people, right? Because no matter how much they beg, they think it's gonna spare them, but it's not gonna be the angry Trump supporters who come to burn down their mansions. It's, it's gonna be these other guys, no matter what penance you offer them. But that sort of gets back to what I was asking you before about, do you think that because the worldview 
is bereft of anything other than politics, that the hole it leaves actually it leaves you with, you know, what people would say is a God-shaped hole, that, there, that there, there is no sort of spiritual anything there. So you become, you become the very thing that you hate, in essence. Yeah, I'm not sure big tech hates it all that much. So, so I actually think, you know, tech started out as, uh, you know, and, and by the way, my parents are both mathematicians and computer programmers. So, I mean, I was raised in a... In, in a techie world. Mm -hmm. Their small business was a seismic data processing co a company. Uh, my parents were programming. I mean, my mom started as a programmer in 1956. Wow. I mean, really the dawn of computers. I think tech started out, you had people, let's say uh, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, drops out of college, goes and starts Facebook, you know, who they're just trying to build a business and they're doing their own thing. And, 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 and big tech didn't start out all that political. Mm -hmm. It was go, you know, hey, you know, play foosball in the office and, and you know, wear shorts and flip-flops and go innovate and be disruptive. You know, the whole disruptor thing is a big part of the ethos. Mm -hmm. And early on, I, I don't see Silicon Valley as, as deeply political. It, it, it's more recently, and it's... It's, it's a clothing of protection for one thing, these guys are the modern day robber barons. I mean, the vast amount of wealth as, as these plutocrats live in, you know, they're, they're owning islands and flying massive jets and, and, and just- They've got walls around those houses, don't they? Uh, they have- Isn't that bizarre? And security with guns? It's all very confusing. And, and it all becomes just, I actually don't think they care that much about this, but they, don't want to be rejected by the mob. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's much more a protective shield. And the world of so social media becomes self-reinforcing, where, you know, we used to have homogenizing institutions, of, of whether it was church or school or the Rotary Club, where, you know, you might be a Democrat, but you knew some Republicans. You might be a Republican, you knew some Democrats. Uh, you might be Christian or Jewish or Muslim, but you, you knew people of different faiths, and, and, and it was not... On social media now, anyone <coughs> who disagrees gets unfriended, and, and it becomes this echo chamber where everyone has the same view. Mm -hmm. and, and when I look at our democracy, I, what I worry about is there aren't shared facts anymore. Yeah. We're not... The left is listening to left-wing websites, they're listening to their own facts. The right is listening to right-wing websites. By the way, look, Fox is every bit as one-sided as biased as MSNBC is, and neither one of them are actually like having, having an objective conversation. That, I worry about what that's doing to our country. Do you ever get invited on MSNBC anymore? Um, I haven't been in a while. I mean, I've done Chris Matthews. Well, he's, um, he's gone. The he's wolf, gone. The yeah, they drove, they, they drove him out. You're right. Yeah. It, it, uh, <laughs> so the last time you were invited by the guy who they took out. Yeah, the there last time I did it, yeah. uh, Chris Hayes interviewed me. We did a thing uh, called Trib Fest, the Texas Tribune mm -hmm. does this big. So I did an hour interview and I agreed, agreed to that. And we actually had a good, actually that was a good substantive conversation. Um, and it was about an hour long, and it, it, you know, look, he came at me pretty hard, which is fine. I mean, that, if we're having a conversation, that's a step in the right direction. So do you miss, I, I mean, I think I know the answer to this, but do you miss sort of the sane, blue dog, more centrist Democrat? Because I think Biden was the last hope of that thing. That's what it strikes me as, and, and clearly he's not gonna be the savior, obviously, for many reasons. but. You know, Jordan Peterson talks about this a lot, that you want this healthy tension between the left and the right. And it's like, look, I, I know I'm new to the right, so maybe I don't see some of the problems that you guys have been around, so you see. But what I see is this pretty diverse group of the real Trump people, the more libertarian people, uh, that, are all, uh, that are all sort of trying to fight for what the future is. On the left, I just see purging. Do you miss the old school you know, I know JFK is before your time, but do you miss an old school Democrat, Daniel Patrick Moynihan? Yes, uh, yeah, uh, look, JFK is a great example. Scoop Jackson on foreign policy who, who believed in standing up to communists. That, mm -hmm. that, 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 
you look at JFK. I, I often quote JFK. You, you, you read his speeches, for example, what he says on, uh, on religious liberty. Mm-hmm. You, you read his speeches on cutting taxes, mm-hmm. where he campaigned in 1960 on we're going to cut your taxes, and we're going to cut your taxes. That's going to produce more jobs, more prosperity. That's going to benefit everyone. Those speeches, he would be driven out of the Democratic Party like some crazy heretic today. Yeah. Um, you look at the tax cut we passed in 2017. You know how many Democrats voted for it in the House? Zero. zero. In the Senate, zero. There was nobody. I'll give you another example, one, one that the media refused to cover, but it's one that I'm, I got very passionate about. The Democrats introduced a constitutional amendment in the Senate to repeal the free speech protections Mm -hmm. of the First Amendment. Now, this was following the Citizens United case, which Mm -hmm. Citizens United has become this totem. So Hillary Clinton pledged, every justice I appoint is going to repeal Citizens United. Joe Biden said the same thing. Um, Do they know when they say that about what the Supreme Court nominees are going to do in the future that that's not really how government works? uh, Well, (laughs) I mean, everyone does this across the board, right? For Democratic nominees, it largely does. Yeah. So I've got a book that's coming out uh, in October called One Vote Away, and it talks about how one vote on the Supreme Court uh, can, can change history, and it goes through the history on the left. So on Citizens United, Citizens United, by the way, like a lot of people don't know what the case was about. It was about a movie maker who made a movie critical of Hillary Clinton, mm-hmm. and the Obama administration wanted to punish the movie maker for daring to criticize Hillary Clinton. And the Democrats introduced a constitutional amendment. The first version of the constitutional amendment would have given the federal government what's called plenary power. Plenary is a legal term that just means blanket, broad, total. Plenary power to regulate any expenditure of money for political speech. That would mean um, if a little old lady spent $5 on a poster board and a stick and put it in her front yard saying vote for Joe Biden or vote for Donald Trump. Congress could make that a crime. That would mean, by the way, look, we're sitting here in a room where you've bought this furniture, you've got TV cameras there. This is expending money. That would mean Congress could regulate Mm -hmm. with total impunity. So we debated it extensively uh, in the Senate. I I asked Democrats on the Judiciary Committee three questions. Should Congress be able to ban movies? Should Congress be able to ban books? And should Congress be able to ban the NAACP? NAACP is a corporation, Mm -hmm. so their second version said, we'll just give them total power over corporations. Well, corporations aren't people. They're collections of people. My answer to those three questions are no, no, and hell no. When we voted on it, do you know that every single Democrat in the Senate voted to repeal the free speech protections of the First Amendment? I mean, there used to be, liberals used to defend, there's there's a famous case that went to the Supreme Court um, where a guy wore into a courthouse a jacket that said F the draft, Mm -hmm. although he didn't abbreviate it. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court rightly upheld his right to to wear that. And, 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 you know, one of the justices said, One man's obscenity is another man's lyric. There are none of those liberals left in politics. There are a handful uh, in the world, but Mm. in politics, they don't believe in free speech anymore, and that's that's scary. Can I give you the Star Wars reference that you can use for this going forward? It's Order 66. That's what the progressives did. They, they executed Order 66 on the liberals, and they hunted them down, and there's a couple in hiding. Bill Maher, maybe three or four other guys, what would have been formerly me, I would say, and, and that's kind of that's where we're at now. It's, you are right, and look, Yoda escaped. <laughs> I, I like yeah. that. That, 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 yeah, that, yeah. that, that has you yeah. hiding out, but, but it... There is a rabid intolerance. So the left demands conformity. And you think about it, socialism. Socialism is about the government being in charge of everything. That demands total conformity. Um, You take something like federalism. I'm a massive believer in federalism. We have 50 states. 
who would expect California to adopt the same laws as Texas? And that's okay. I, look, I, that's why we have 50 states. You can choose. I think the laws of each state should reflect the values. So let's take something like drug legalization. So personally speaking, I'm not in favor of drug legalization. But I think it's a state question. I think it's mm -hmm. perfectly fine for different states to come to different answers on it. And, totally and, and for there to be a diversity and to see what works. The left doesn't like that diversity. And I'll give you an example. Here's, here's a question very few people ask. Socialized medicine. Yeah. So, so it's become the new mantra that everyone has to support socialized medicine, Medicare care for all. There are 50 states in the union. How many have adopted socialized medicine? Is it maybe three? Is it zero? Is it, what about zero. Massachusetts? Didn't nope. they do something? Nope. No? no, they did Romney care, yeah. which was the predecessor to Obamacare. But let's take California. California, yeah. there's a Democratic governor, a Democratic supermajority in the legislature. They could adopt socialized yeah. medicine tomorrow. Yep. You know why they didn't? Because they ran the numbers and it bankrupt the state. Right. Well, when Obama had a supermajority himself as president, he didn't do it. It, it, it Vermont, Bernie Sanders' home state, they don't have socialized medicine. Here's part of the reason why. If California adopted it and there's nothing, Republicans can't stop yeah, them. Can't. <laughs> it is the Democrats who have decided we, that we should not have socialized medicine in California. And the reason is the taxes they would have to impose would crush small businesses even more. It would cause them to flee the state, to move to Texas. So, so what does the left want to do? Here's our solution. Let's impose it on the whole damn country. So you can't flee unless you're willing to go to New Zealand. Yeah. If you're going to stay in the United States, there's no place to go. My view, look, under the Constitution, if California wants socialized medicine, knock yourself out. I think yeah. it's a bad policy, but prove me wrong. Go show me that it works. But it, it is the view everyone must conform that I think is really dangerous. So you mentioned the uh, debates that you had with yeah. Bernie Sanders, the couple on CNN. I saw them. And when people say to me, well, Dave, you, you seem so different politically than you did five years ago, I always say the one thing that I really did shift on was economics. Mm -hmm. So I'm way more right libertarian yeah. on economics. Most of the other things, actually, I still believe I'm standing up for my, my true liberal beliefs, not mm -hmm. the way liberalism has been butchered now. Um, when, when you had those debates with him, do you think Bernie now slightly regrets what he has unleashed here? Because I think you could look at the, the crazed Marxist lunacy and the squad and identity politics and the hatred of America. I mean, every, every Bernie debate, what was it? We're gonna have, a, I mean, he kept saying political revolution because he knew if he sa just said revolution, that means heads on spikes, which that's coming, but yeah. give it a little while. Um, but do you think he maybe regrets some of what he has led to here? Or do you think he's just, riding it out. Now, I'm, I'm also, I will say one other thing, which is I'm a firm believer they will take him out too, because eventually he will just be an old failed white guy who played by the system, played by the rules. I, I don't think he regrets it. So, so Bernie is a true believer. Um, and, and, and I prefer honesty. Um, a lot of Democrats for a long time pretended they weren't socialists, even though they voted like it. Bernie's changed that party and changed that party dramatically. And look, I think Bernie is grumpy that he's not the savior yeah. that he wanted to be. Uh, so look, a lot of revolutionaries in Cuba, Fidel Castro was about Fidel Castro. He wanted yeah. the power to be the dictator. I think Bernie is unhappy. You know, there's a particular kind of bitterness. You look at how Bernie deals with, say, an Elizabeth Warren. Yeah. Yeah. who is a, you know, younger interloper, and both of them look at AOC and go, who the hell are you? Now, they, they're they all on the same team, but it's sort of... A... Except I don't think, I, I agree he's a true believer, but I don't think he had like this sort of true, true fundamental hatred of all of our institutions. AOC, Ilhan Omar, the others. Now again, I, I, I'm not saying I'm totally right about this, but I sense like a, a real like let's destroy the whole damn thing with them. Then I think Bernie was the was the thing that allowed it into the system. Well, and you look at for example, let's take statues that that are being torn yeah. down. So so the debate started with Confederate statues, and and we can have a conversation about that. Um, look, I'm one that believes we shouldn't erase history, but but. 
I also believe slavery is the original sin of America. It is a grotesque evil, and our nation fought a bloody civil war where 600,000 people died to end slavery. And our journey to civil rights, it has been a long journey. It's been an imperfect journey. We continue on that journey, but, but as, as Dr. Martin Luther King said, the arc of history bends towards justice. But it started out as a discussion of Confederate monuments. Mm -hmm. Then it became a discussion of George Washington, of Thomas Jefferson, of James Madison. Uh, it became people defacing statues of Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant because, you know, they were such big Confederates. Yeah, yeah. Frederick Douglass. So the ignorance of it, Frederick Douglass, like the angry mob at some point, when you're attacking Washington and Lincoln and Frederick Douglass, it's not that you hate slavery, it's not that you hate racism, you hate America. But so what I'm trying to figure out though, when I see today's Democrats, it's even Pelosi, when she's now nodding to them, like, oh, well, people have legitimate grievances. And it's like, I don't think she believes it, but she's just trying not to get her mansion burned down. I, like, do you, do you think it's that bad? Like, it seems to me that I, that's obvious at this point. I, I, I think it, it is, <laughs> there's a video I saw on Twitter of, uh, some college kids, I think they were in New York and there oh. was a riot and then- <laughs> We're like, on your side. You were on your side. I mean, it was, <laughs> it, it was yeah. no, 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 don't burn us down. Yeah, so they throw the rock through their right, window right. and they're supposedly cheering them on and it's like, nobody's, there's no side the, because the, it's a- it, it, and you look at, look, you look at the angry Marxists who want to destroy this country. And, and I worry, I worry about our education that people don't understand what we have in America is unique in the history of the world. Um, most of history, look, free speech, free speech doesn't exist in many countries on earth today. And we're not training our kids to, to know, to understand the degree to which they're just being told everything is systematically racist. You know, we just had a debate in the Senate Judiciary Committee where all, all these Democrats are saying, nothing has changed in the 50 years. I'm like, what utter garbage, nothing has changed. We had Jim Crow laws, we had, we had segregated schools, we had segregated water fountains. We, we, you're saying the march in Selma didn't do, any, didn't do anything? I mean, that, that is, and the problem is it's a lie. Mm -hmm. If people don't understand the journey towards justice, towards protecting people's rights, then they want to burn it all down, which ends up hurting everybody's rights. So, okay, so the obvious question there is, are the two, as we watch now mainstream media burn down and the institutions burn down, so you're, you're a Harvard guy, you're a Princeton guy. These are institutions that are on fire right now. I, I would say rightfully so. The New York Times, rightfully so, the 1619 Project, let this thing freaking burn the amount of hit pieces that they've done on me, that they've done on, on people in my circles that I'm sure they've done on you. But are you worried that if all of these liberal in the right sense of liberalism, institutions burn down, that we will have nothing that will allow us for national cohesion? Because you sort of hit on that earlier. Yeah, I, I'm deeply worried about it. Um, th they're no longer liberal in any real sense of the word. They yeah. are authoritarian. The New York Times fired their editor because he dared write an op-ed from a U.S. senator. Yeah. No, he didn't write it. He just allowed he it to publish be, it. He, yeah, he yeah, allowed he it to be published. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, think about yeah. for the for a second. And then look, actually, I you know look the 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 op-ed that Tom Cotton wrote. It was okay. I actually didn't agree with a lot of the <laughs> stuff he said. I thought it was a, a bit a bit much. But if you disagreed with it, write something saying it's wrong. Like like like. Why are you, part of it is, it, it's a testament of fear. You don't believe in your own ideas. Mm -hmm. um, free speech, and by the way, you hear people in, in the Senate all the time say, well, speech that's offensive shouldn't be allowed. Uh, that's exactly what the First Amendment is about. It, you don't need the First Amendment for speech that everyone agrees with. If the majority agrees with it, 
you don't need the First Amendment to protect your rights to say puppy dogs are nice. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's like, at least right now, nobody yeah. is stopping the, the pro puppy dog. Yeah, speech. patience, patience. I, you know, Supreme Court in another famous decision, Skokie, Illinois, the Nazis wanted to march. Supreme Court rightly said, you've got a right to march. Now, by the way, when it comes to Nazis, I'm perfectly happy to say they're evil, ignorant, bigoted morons. And I'm not scared of them saying whatever idiocy they want to say because now, I think we have a moral obligation to engage in it, to say why it's wrong, but, but government shouldn't silence them. You know, why should we be afraid of the Klan? The Klan are idiots, and we need to demonstrate why what they're saying is wrong. But inevitably, the mob calls everyone a Nazi or Klansman, and they use it to justify regulating. You know, J.K. Rowling yep. now can't say women exist, that that is deemed the same as Adolf Hitler. Okay, that's just a little nuts. Like, like, like we can have a, a respectful civil conversation, but you're right, there are no Walter Cronkite. We used to report on, now look, Cronkite leaned left, but not in a mm -hmm. virulently partisan way. And some of it is the media. Trump broke the media. Yeah. But like they hate him so much, there is no longer, there used to be, five years ago, the media pretended they're impartial. Remember they would argue there is no bias in media? Mm -hmm. Have you heard anyone make yeah, that Yeah, nobody argument? says that anymore. Because it's so obvious that they've decided we're not, they no longer hold out impartiality as an objective to which when the New York Times... Well, because impartiality is now proof that you're somehow racist or something I, like that. The 1619 the system. Project yeah. is a fundamentally racist, bigoted endeavor, and the New York Times admits to redefine history. Mm -hmm. And the real danger of the 1619 Project is going to be all the little tyranny of leftists in the school boards that begin teaching it in schools. Th this is propaganda uh, that, that, that is of Orwellian proportions. So Senator Cruz, are you telling me that the United States didn't invent slavery? We didn't invent slavery? I mean, we, we also got rid of it pretty quickly. They don't really want to get that. And it was going on for thousands and thousands of years and it's still going on in parts of the world. Uh, well, Somehow that's inconvenient. And, and, and listen, the abolitionists, so, so, so one of the rich ironies is the Democrats who moralize on questions of race. The Democratic Party is an absolute friggin' train wreck on race. The Democrat, it was Democrats who founded the KKK. It was Democrats who wrote Jim Crow. Uh, it, it was Democrats who implemented segregation. The party I'm a member of, the Republicans, was founded to oppose slavery. Abraham Lincoln was the yeah, first well, Republican uh, president. The yeah, reason yeah. we were founded. Now, here's the Democratic narrative. Well, yes, that was true then. Nathan Bedford Forrest, who's the founder of the KKK, was a delegate to the Democratic National Convention in 1860. The, the, the media narrative is, yes, that was then, but, but the Democrats changed. Well, interesting. Let's go to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. A lot more, uh, a lot higher percentage of Republicans supported that than Democrats did. It was the Dixiecrats. Mm -hmm. Bull Connor was a Democrat. The, the, the guys with the dogs and the clubs beating the civil rights protesters, without exception, were Democrats. And they said, well, okay, fine. That's true up to the 60s, but magically it changed. Dave, right now today as we sit here, the sitting governor of Virginia mm -hmm. chose to put in his yearbook a picture of a Klansman, and it may or may not have been him. <laughs> yeah, may or now, may now, not. Now think of the pathology of the media for a second. So Ralph Northam, who's a Democrat, he's an elected Democrat today, not 50 years ago, not 100 years ago, today in 2020. He put in his yearbook a picture of one guy dressed as a Klansman or another guy in blackface. Now what an indictment of the media that everyone freaked out about the blackface. Now look, 
All right, I can accept that blackface, I, I can understand why that would be seen as disrespectful. I think the media is a little freaked out about it. Like every late night comic is dressed in blackface. I, and, and I don't think it was a big deal in Texas. I don't think I've ever known anyone who's dressed in blackface. It seems like in Virginia, every elected politician just about did it. <laughs> but it was weird that between the two, they have this, this, this hysterical fit about the blackface and no one comments about the Klan outfit. And Ralph Northam's comment, the day after it broke, it was the most revealing, it was before they had gotten their, their talking points down. He said, um, he acknowledged that he could have been one of those two people, and he didn't say which one. Mm -hmm. If you're in elected office and you cannot say categorically, I have never in my life dressed as a Klansman, mm -hmm. You talk about cancel culture, as far as I'm concerned, vote, if you don't know if you've been a Klansman, I'm more than prepared to vote you out off. So is that Trump's greatest skill? Because you guys went at it pretty hard in 2016, and now you've become one of, I, would, you, I would say you're one of his biggest allies yeah. in the Senate. Um, but you guys were going after each other and said a lot of mean stuff about each other and all that. But would you say his greatest skill is that, well, you said it earlier, that he broke the media, but that he broke the inequity in the system. The inequity in the system meaning that culture just yep. teaches everybody, you're a Republican, you're a conservative, you're on the right, you're bad, you're a Democrat, you're a lefty, whatever, you're good. And that Trump broke the whole damn thing. And that that is why we're all kind of crazy right now. But, but in my view at this point, it, it was a necessary move. Yeah, so yes, I think there are a couple of things. I think one, by the way, we've been talking for almost an hour. We only said Trump like twice. I think we just set yeah. some sort of record yeah. here. That's, that's pretty impressive. Look, I think 2016 was a giant screw you to Washington. I think working class voters were fed up with Washington. Um, you want to understand the 2016 election, it's blue collar workers across the country. There's a reason why in 2016, Trump and I in almost every state in the primary Either he was one and I was two with blue collar voters or I was one and he was two and it's almost perfectly correlated. The states where I was one and he was two are the 12 states I won. Hmm. The states where he was one and I was two are the states he won and no other Republican won more than a single state. It was a blue collar revolution. Who, who even won one besides you? Kasich did, won did, Ohio, oh, Kasich won Ohio. Rubio won Minnesota, Trump and I won the other 48. And by the way, and remember at the beginning, there were 17 Republicans, conventional wisdom. If you were ranking those 17, Nobody in Washington or New York would have said Trump had a chance, and no one said I had a chance. We might have been 16 and 17 on the ordinal rankings of, of, of who had a shot. Right, and by the way, you had men, women, black people, Latinos, white people, the whole thing. What did they have on the I, other I side? I remember a bunch of reporters, uh, I was in South Carolina and I was doing a press gaggle, and a bunch of reporters said, what do you do about the fact that Republicans are a bunch of old white guys? And I stopped and just started laughing, and I said, number one, have you looked at the Democratic field? They're literally septuagenarian socialists, all of them. I, do you know how many Hispanics have ever won a presidential primary in the Democratic Party? A presidential primary? Yeah. Well, I'm guessing a, zero. A, a state. I'm, I'm yeah. talking about a single Even state. Even a single state? I, um, I'm going to guess it's zero. Zero. It, yeah. I, you know, Julian Castro was complaining that, you know, the de you know, we shouldn't have Iowa voting because no, because no Hispanic yeah. can win. Well, I, I pointed out, look, you look at the 2016 field. We've got an African-American world-famous neurosurgeon. We've got a woman who was a CEO of a Fortune 50 company. We've got two sons of Cuban immigrants mm -hmm. who are in their 40s. I mean, you want to talk about, like, but the press still described us as old white guys. Right. And the old white guys who are socialist at, the, at their Bolshevik reunion a, a, as somehow, you know, Elizabeth Warren just, just <laughs> said, we need new leaders. Do you know how yeah, old yeah. Joe Biden, do you know when <laughs> Joe Biden was sworn into the Senate? 37 years ago, something crazy. Oh, 1973. I was two when Joe Biden took his oath of office. He's been presiding over an awful lot of problems. I, I, do you find it hilarious then when, as the primary was rolling out, the Democratic primary, that every time 
someone that was a minority or a perceived minority dropped out, they basically said that their own party was racist. They yep. would say, well, we're not diverse enough. It's like, well, it's your base yep. that's voting you guys out. You can't blame this. But somehow the media spins it that you suddenly like, oh, I guess the Republicans are racist. It, it, it's facts don't matter for their narrative. They are, it, it is a propaganda effort. So I think the tr Trump election in 2016 was number one, a screw you to Washington. Number two, it was working class voters. Um, under Obama, the Democratic Party made a choice. It was a very conscious choice. Between two traditional favored children of the Democratic Party, you were talking about old, the old Democrats where there were blue dog Democrats. Um, the Democrats made a choice between California environmentalist billionaires and the jobs of labor union members. Now look, the Democratic Party used to be FDR, it used to be the working man, the union party, and under Obama, the party decided it wanted the money from the Tom mm -hmm. Steyers of the world mm -hmm. more than it wanted the steel workers and the truck drivers in Pennsylvania to have jobs. And so they consciously, and their view was the union bosses will deliver the votes. Those used to be our foot soldiers. We're going to vote to shut down the Keystone Pipeline. Screw the jobs. Okay, those guys don't get jobs because it makes us feel better mm -hmm. as, as we are living in multi-million dollar mansions and it doesn't affect our life, it makes us feel better to give away their jobs. I think the working class roar back at Washington was a big part of 2016. And I also think, look, it's interesting. The, I don't think the phrase cancel culture existed in 2016. It was called political correctness mm -hmm, then. Mm -hmm. But the fact that Trump would say, would stand up and speak out and he'd go around the gatekeepers, it's why social media has gotten more vigorous. They're mad that anyone got around the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to close off the avenues of communication. Okay, so I know we're crunched on time here and I wanna get a couple uh, video game minutes in with you. So we'll try to do this quick. So do you think, and I don't mean this as a shot to you, but do you think Trump, the reason Trump won was because he was willing to do stuff that you would not have done? Because I think there's a sense of that. Remember there was that moment when Marco Rubio tried it for a day. There was literally yeah, that and one. It, it didn't work. And it, and it, it just was, blew up in his face. Well, but, but do you think, and, and maybe that's not a shot to you or it's, I don't know if it's credit to Trump or just a, it has something to do with how we're all wired or something like that. So in, in authenticity doesn't work. People can, can smell it when you're a fake. Yeah. Uh, Trump won the primary in 2016 because the media gave him $3 billion in free media. And it has no precedent in the history of politics. $3 billion in free media. But do you think that was because he was willing to do something, no. meaning just no. blow no, apart I, I, the system? I, I actually think it was fundamental corruption on the part of the media. So mm -hmm. I think the mainstream media, ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, MSNBC, they all wanted Hillary to win. And they believed Trump was the easiest candidate for Hillary to beat. And I think they made a very conscious decision, all Trump all the time, because they wanted Hillary to win. I think they were corrupt. I think that they had that same corruption. But the consequence, I mean, we've had over two centuries of politics. There's never been a candidate worth $3 billion of free media. It, it, it became a tsunami that in the last 30 days, there was $500 million of free media and, and we couldn't be heard anymore. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I do think people were fed up with Washington and, and that's what 2016 was, was a, a statement about that. All right, so I said, I said two more, but I'm gonna yeah. throw in one more extra so there's still are two. Um, what, what do you make of the Never Trump crew, like this Lincoln Project, these people who are now supporting all Democrats, and now we're talking about, it's not just about taking out Trump anymore, now it's out, we're gonna find the congressional candidates and the candidates in the Senate. What, what do you make of these people who, Trump, like him, don't like him, orange, big hair, it's like he's doing the things that conservatives want done. So whenever anyone tells you it's not about the money, it's about the money. Look, these Lincoln, Lincoln Project guys are a bunch of political operatives we're making millions. Who also got everything wrong always, forever. Oh, Bill look, Crystal. Look, look, they, they have been, they've been operatives for a long time. So you want to look at the pattern? They've run a lot of losing presidential races, losing to Democrats. They're very good at losing to Democrats. In significant part, you look at all of these guys, 
So I think the real divide we have is not racial, it's socioeconomic. It, it is the difference between wealthy elites and working class voters. All of these so-called anti-Trump folks are the people who've been saying screw you to the working class voters for 20 years. That, and they're still echoing that. And by the way, I think now they're just making a buck. I mean, they're, they're printing money to put money in their own bank account. And, and listen, when it comes to Trump, there are a lot of things Trump says and does I don't like. Um, I agree with many of the policies he's implemented. And I think he's shown real backbone. And the role I've tried to play the last four years is, is to encourage the president to go in a, in a positive direction, to encourage him, let's take social media. You know, this order, I had been urging the administration for three years for yeah. them to do this. So I'm glad they did it. It took a lot of work. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful. As a president, I think his best characteristic is that he has a backbone. He's, he's willing to make decisions that many Republicans wouldn't make. Things like moving our embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. I mm -hmm. urged him to do that. Both the State Department Defense Department didn't want him to do that. They argued against it. His own State Department Defense Department. Yeah. And every president had run on saying they were going to do it for... Democrats and Republicans yeah. had broken that promise over and over again. Pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal. Again, state and defense said don't do it. I urged him to do it. He did it. Look, that took balls. Yeah. I, I'm grateful for that. Do I wish he didn't say didn't send some ridiculous tweets? Of course I do. Um, there are times when it ends up being less effective. But, you know, on Capitol Hill, the reporters run to you and they want to comment on every tweet. And I tell them, I said, look, I have a rule of thumb. I don't comment on tweets. Because I'm not interested in just playing media pundit and responding to, you know, at 10.07 a.m. the president <laughs> tweeted this, at 10.09 a.m. Yeah. I, I don't need to do that. I, I, let's, you want to talk about substance? Let's talk about free speech. Let's talk about religious liberty. Let's talk about the Second Amendment. Let's talk about securing the border. Let's talk about rebuilding our military. I'll talk about substance. But, and I think on substance we've gotten a lot done. All right, so now I got one more yeah. for you. We did, we did now 70 some odd minutes. My guys are gonna shoot me and I know you gotta get over to PragerU after this. Um, we didn't talk about COVID at all. So yeah. if you could just kind of couch like how you're feeling we're doing at this very moment, the state's rights part of this. Right. And, and I guess most importantly, and this will be a sort of a good ending. Do we ever get out of this phase, this thing that we're all feeling right now between COVID, between the protests, between the oncoming election, do we ever get out of this thing and back to something that feels more normal? Or is, to bring it back to sci-fi, are we heading to a, a, a brave new world, a, a dystopian future, a, something like that? Yes, we'll come out of this. How um, about a question like that when you only have like three minutes left? But you do what you, <laughs> do what you gotta do. This actually connected to where we started. This is a good, good place to wrap up about how polarized and tribalized we are. One of the things I find bizarre about this pandemic is how people look, look at it through a political lens. It's all politics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my view on, on the virus, it's serious, it's deadly. Um, we need to take serious steps to combat it. And I've laid out a whole series of steps and been advocating for it, whether it's increased testing, uh, whether it's investments in vaccines and, and treatments, that we need to use common sense to stop the spread of the virus. But at the same time, people's jobs matter. 44 million people losing their jobs, that produces real suffering. It produces death. Mm -hmm. You know, talk about mm -hmm. mental illness and depression, and alcohol and substance abuse, destroying people's livelihoods is a problem. We need to balance. And what's weird is the idea of balance, the idea of let's use some common sense. It feels kind of lonely saying that because, all right, let's take, for example, masks. Masks have become this bizarre virtue signal. Um, so listen, on the right, there's some people like, never wear a mask no matter what. I'm like, okay, that seems a little out there. 
on the left, they're Democrats who their social media picture has a mask. I, you know, I remember one, you know, Sherrod Brown, the senator from Ohio, gave a floor speech in the Senate a couple of weeks ago. He's wearing a mask during the whole speech. There's no one within 20 feet of him. He's standing alone on the Senate floor with a mask because it's a sign, I am righteous. I am wearing the clothes of the high priest. Now look, uh, you and I talked about it. I've got my damn mask in my pocket. It's go. a Houston Rockets you, you mask. You didn't make up the Elijah Wan story. Um, you know, I, I believe in, you know, do things that are sensible and use common sense, but it, it viewing it all through a political lens. By the way, I have a prediction. If, God forbid, Biden wins, the day after the election, everything will be better. The day after the election, everyone will say, go back to school, go back to work. Oh, the COVID, just like, at like, the COVID like, level. It, it, I, I, the <laughs> disease won't suddenly be cured. <laughs> right, right, but right. But everyone, like the people who are saying, shut it down, there's a political urgency. Yeah. They want the Great Depression because they want to de defeat Trump. If Bi They won't even wait till Biden is sworn in. If Biden is elected that week, they'll say, all right, everyone needs to go back to work and go back to school. So and you believe they're deliberately tanking the economy. I mean, I, I, I've tweeted that to something to that effect. I believe that Gavin Newsom here in California is trying to destroy the economy so either the feds have to bail us out or... or they hate Trump so much, it's all-consuming. And, and, and the angry left, they've convinced themselves that Donald Trump is Hitler. So everything is justified yeah. in terms of defeating Hitler. And it's, it's just like, okay, that's... And, and by the way, the answer, the politicized answer on either side, shut everything down forever or everyone go back to perfectly normal and don't, you know... Pretend there's no pandemic. Neither one of those make a lot of sense to me. But listening to medical professionals and following common sense and also respecting people's jobs, in the media world, who, who's advocating that? You don't get, if you're not yeah. advocating an extreme position, it doesn't exist. Senator, I feel like we just started here, but it has been 80 minutes and you got a busy day ahead of you. But right, I we promise gotta you- We got to close the way you started oh, though, yes. which is reminding people to go subscribe to the Verdict Podcast, <laughs> either on the podcast- Oh, you've really become a podcast on YouTube, yeah. give us a five-star rating, subscribe. Look, Verdict Podcast, as you know, we launched it during impeachment. It became yep. the number one podcast in the world when we launched it. And so come sign on. And what we're doing every week is having conversations yes trying to actually understand what's what's going on in the world and, and address real substance and, and have I, fun too. And I'm pretty sure that that Michael Knowles guy is standing on the other <laughs> side of that door right now because we're going to do a little pickup for Ruben Report. It was a pleasure. I hope you'll come back to, uh, to talk about your book in October when it comes out. Excellent. And may the force be with you. Indeed. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop yelling, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.